Welcome to part two of our series on Mathers Bridge. If you haven't seen part one that talks about what the current day bridge is all about, I've left the link in the description below. In part two of this series, you'll learn how John Reed Mathers came to build a bridge back in the 1920s and how the bridge became an integral part of the development of this area. Since the time we recorded part one, we were fortunate enough to interview Lola Mathers Haskins, granddaughter of John Mathers, who still lives nearby. She was born in 1926, just one year before the bridge opened, so she witnessed with her own eyes the early years of the original Mathers Bridge and watched this area flourish. Lola grew up in what was the city of O'Galley, where her parents and grandparents lived. It's the historic area on the western side of the O'Galley Causeway, which is now part of Melbourne. When Lola graduated from high school, there were a grand total of 10 students in her graduating class, which gives you a sense for how few people lived here before World War II. Let's let Lola start us off with some history of John Mathers and how he came to this area. I have a record of my grandfather uh, as a 17-year-old boy on the census, and he lived in Georgia. Oh. And my grandfather uh, must have come down here. My great-grandfather was William, and they moved to Jefferson County near, Tallah uh, near Tallahassee somewhere. And then my grandfather came here as a 19-year-old boy to raise pineapples on uh, Merritt Island for a Mr. Casper. Well, when he came there and was uh, working for Mr. Casper growing pineapples, when it came time for him to uh, pay him, instead he took land. And he owned land even north of there, all the, almost all the way up to that packing house. Uh, where the road widens up out there is where their, the packing house was. And I didn't know it was a packing house, and I didn't know that he had lived there before, but I think he did when he was working over there. As you can see, John Mathers recognized the promise of this area and had the vision to take land rather than cash for his labors, and so came to own and subsequently farm the land on the southern part of Merritt Island. At one point, he owned all the land from where the island widens down to the tip of Dragon Point. Farming pineapples on Merritt Island was not an easy life at the turn of the century. Not only did Mathers expend an immense amount of physical labor to create a successful farm on Merritt Island, he persevered through brutally hot and humid summer days without electricity or air conditioning or pesticide, and the mosquitoes were a constant battle. That was even when I was living there. I went up with my dad one day up there somewhere, land he owned up where the road narrows out. And uh, he always wore, had to wear long pants and long sleeve shirts. The mosquitoes were so bad. He said, you stay in the car, don't get out. And I don't know what he went there for. And I was with him and you could see the the mosquitoes were so bad, they couldn't hardly see out the windows of the car. They were just so bad. They were terrible. I don't know how anybody lived over there back then. But John Mathers had a bigger problem than mosquitoes. His large family, including Lola's father, resided on the other side of the Indian River in the city of O'Galley, and there was no reasonable land route to get from his farm to his home, so he commuted by rowboat. Uh, uh, the reason they were, that he built the bridge over there, he was living uh, as a young man over there. He had to go back and forth by boat to get there from O'Galley when he was living in O'Galley. In a rowboat, that's how he got back and forth and that's the reason he decided to build the bridge. He was tired of rowing back and forth. Wow. So he got permission from, I guess, the county and whoever else was in charge of it for the land around there to build the bridge. That's a heck of a road. No wonder he didn't want to do that. I think he had a motorized... <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> Good Lord. That yeah. Incredible. John Mathers was highly motivated to find an easier way to get home to his family especially since he had been rowing the two miles across the often rough and windy waters of the Indian River for over two decades, and he was still making that trek when he was in his mid-60s. 
As soon as the O'Galley Bridge opened in 1926, his prayers for a land route home were half answered. If he could get across the Banana River to what's now Indian Harbor Beach, he could walk down to the O'Galley Bridge, cross the Indian River, and he was home. So he started looking for investors to jointly finance a toll bridge across the Banana River. Let's let Lola Mathers Haskins tell the story. He had some two other men go in with him and they were going to finance it. And they backed out on him, so he took $40,000 of his own money and had it built. Wow. And uh, uh, a firm, I've got the name somewhere of it, and Jacksonville is the one that came down there and built the bridge. And I know when they took it out and uh, made it out of concrete, it was originally cypress wood all the it was a wooden bridge. And uh, when they uh, took it out, they said that was the best mechanism and that turnstile they had ever run across. Articles that and I, when as a young girl, my mother and I got out there and turned it when it had to open it, you had to open it by hand. There was no electricity over there then, of course. And then my, then my dad's uh, brother, Roy, came over there and built a, a water wheel for electricity. Most people don't know that the original Mathers Bridge was actually a toll bridge, complete with a toll house on the west side near Merritt Island. Uh, that was a built as a toll bridge. I don't know if you knew that or not. And they charged different fees for it. I think the highest fee was 35 cents for a horse and mule or something that came over there. 15 cents for a person. And then they charged for people fishing off there also. And uh, people, I think every child in Brevard County has fished off that bridge at one time. At the start of World War II, there was no Port Canaveral or Barge Canal, so Mathers Bridge became the gateway for military boat traffic traveling from the protected intracoastal waterway to the newly constructed Banana River Naval Air Station, home base for the U.S. aircraft that watched for German submarines off the east coast of Florida. In this day and age, most people don't know that during the war, German submarines sank many ships off the east coast of the U.S. In order for boats of any size to reach the Naval Air Station, Mathers Bridge needed to be swung open. I said there was over 2,000 and some ships sunk. Yeah. Astounding. Well, we're lucky. That's the reason Banana River Naval Air Station was built, because Jacksonville had a, a, a Naval Air Station and Key West had one, and they needed one in between here and I worked up there right out of high school. And what I did was order airplane parts for the PBYs and the PBM air airplanes that were coasting along the coast here looking for those submarines. That was the purpose of building Banana River Naval Air Station. And then Patrick, after the war, there was no, after the war was over with Germany, there was no need, I guess, for the Navy to keep the base here patrolling for subs. Mm -hmm. So uh, Patrick Air Force Bank came in there. During World War II, the people in the city of O'Galley were keenly aware of the threat right off their coastline. But my father had, uh, my dad, had bought the, uh, on Highland Avenue, the Brooks Building over there. It's right across the street from the Methodist Church. And we were living there. My dad on the paper said he bought it so my mother and, and I and my brother would have a place to live. It was a rooming house. And my mother lived there and made a, uh, in the back of it made a, um, kitchen to cook in and she rented out the rest of the rooms and during the war the Coast Guard men lived there and we had to break out our lights headlights on our cars so they wouldn't reflect out into the ocean 
with all the submarines here. And uh, I talked to one of the Coast Guard men one day, and he told me that they caught a German that had been over to Mosley's grocery store in Ogallia and was crossing back over the causeway with a loaf of bread to get back to the sub. And they put him in jail. There was a jail in Ogallia then. And then later they transferred him to Titusville, which was the county seat then. And I don't know what happened to him after that. After the war was over, Merritt Island became a popular place to live with the easy access provided by Mathers Bridge. It's been a long history in the making. The bridge you see today is the third generation of the original wooden bridge opened in 1927. Next time you make that trip over Mathers Bridge by car or through the bridge by boat, give pause for a few seconds of respect for one of the original pioneers of the east coast of Florida, John Reed Mathers.